So Christmas is coming. Um, and public health experts implored people to stay home for Thanksgiving. Many didn't. And the number of COVID cases is rising. And now they've said the same thing about Christmas. And I overheard someone say um, that even more people are heading out for the holidays now than went out for Thanksgiving. Um, in fact, I found this on the news, the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration that lets you into the airport, put out a report that over a million people already flew on Saturday. Already over a million people already flew on Friday. So this is a week ahead. The highest number, the highest traffic days since the COVID thing began has been happening. So people are going, doing their Christmas thing. And, and it's understandable. The, you know, the longing to be together, it's been a long time. It's been, you know, it's, it's a special time for, for many, many, many families. Um, so I wanted to go back to a story um, that I kind of half heard that was on National Public Radio in um, November to look at this phenomenon. Adi Cornish, Cornish was the reporter, and she was interviewing Dr. Gaurav Suri, who's a computational neuroscientist. I meant to look up what a computational neuroscientist actually does, but um, he's at the San Francisco State University. But his area of expertise, I guess this says what a computational neuroscientist does, is decision-making and psychological inertia. I thought, mm, I should talk to him. I have that. Um, so he also studies emotion and emotion regulation. But this decision-making and psychological inertia was the um, topic of this interview. And um, Cornish was saying to him, that, that's, and, and this is true, because of, the, what, because of our government, so much of the work of controlling the spread has been put in the hands of individuals. Um, I mean, it would, it would be anyway, even if the government had performed differently. That would still be in the hands of in individuals. So, so regular, ordinary people are asked to make the right decision for the broader good. And that message, you know, gets to different people in different ways. And tens of thousands of lives depend on how, many, how much Americans respect the real danger of the coronavirus. And that's what he was addressing. He was addressing why our brains struggle to make um, the right decisions. And I found this so interesting as a parallel for our Dharma study. So I will say normally the, the, this relationship between how science, science relates to Buddhism is not something I'm all that interested in. But when you get validation that, oh, that what we're doing is really backed by um, neuroscience, I think is kind of interesting. So he says there's a myth that our brain takes in data, that we compute it, and then we come out with the right decision. <laughs> right, laugh. We all know that's not even how that works. But he also said that's not how humans decide. He said we have these multiple decision-making systems at work. And you know, if, as you watch your own mind, you see that there are multiple decision-making systems at work. So one system and especially in the context of the pandemic, the, he calls it the associative effortless system, is telling us everything is OK. Why? We go outside. He said, the street looks just the same. We look in the mirror. We look the same. We look at our family. They all look the same. Everything's fine. We're all the same. <laughs> so all the cues in our immediate environment are telling us that everything is normal. You know, there's not a big hole in the street. It's not like somebody put out a bomb out there or, you know, no volcano went off or nobody's face is falling off. I mean, it's, it's all normal. So our immediate feedback is that everything is okay. That's like our direct sense perception and in our interpretation of that. Everything is okay. And then one other aspect of therefore about the disease is that we don't actually see it at work when people even have it they go into isolation right they have to be contained 
even in the hospitals, they have to be separated from everybody. We're not seeing it visually. 329,000 people are dead. I mean, that's a numbing number. It's beyond thought. What city has 330,000 people in it? I mean, it's bigger than Spokane now. Gone. But we don't see it. So he says there's, a, um, there's another thing that's more abstract about how we get the information. So we read about it. That's sort of kind of abstract. We read stories about it. You may watch videos about people we have lost, um, like uh, public broadcasting. What's it called? PBS is trying to do that by doing, you know, doing lives five at a time. You know, that's hard. <laughs> it's a drop in a bucket. New York Times has a really, really long list. You scroll it a few times and you can't bear to look anymore. It's just too much to even see. So it's the information that we have also, as you look at charts, that's all abstract information. And he says, this is engaging the second kind of a second kind of a system in our brain that's called the goal-directed way of thinking that is much more resource intensive. It takes more effort. It takes more work. And it's a much slower process than the immediate response to the, our look in the mirror and I look fine. So he says we have these two systems in conflict. And one is saying that everything is the same. We should go about business as usual. And the other was saying, no, things are profoundly not the same. But it being a slower process, it gets overridden very easily. This tension between the two systems, and it's also a weaker system in most in human beings, right? So this is the system that we're operating our Dharma practice on. The um, what's the name of it? The goal-directed way of thinking, slower, taking more effort. Now, what do I mean? For one thing, I mean, just hearing him talk, I found, I mean, this is a totally a description of how ignorance is at work in our minds. There it is, reinforced by neuroscience. How we cling to that which is permanent, impermanent, as permanent. How we cling to that which is impure by nature as pure. How we cling to what is in nature, dukkha, as pleasurable, and to what is selfless as having a definable, intrinsic, independent existence. We look, it looks fine, it looks, uh, we interpret it as looking good, it looks permanent. <laughs> All those things that, um, I mean, it's not, our, it's not our visual perception that's getting that, but we look at it and we interpret that immediately as everything is, you know, appearing in the way that is opposite from actually how it is. And this is why we're not wearing masks, many people, and this is why people want to get on the plane and go to Chicago to see grandma. It's very clear. So it's only through analysis then and engaging what Dr. Sari calls the goal-directed system that we can use inference to realize that the street is actually changing moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment. We have to really think about that. So when we meditate on our precious human life, for example, we have a bigger picture of what we have going on for us right now. We have to really think about it. We have to engage with that. We have to you know, put that imprint in our mind to be able to hold again and again and again and again the appreciation, even for our precious human life. When we meditate on death and impermanence, we have to think about it again and again and again and again and again. Because even however many times you do it, you still don't think, I don't think I'm going to die today. I have plans. I expect to reach Deva on Christmas Day. So still, that hasn't completely gone into our system. And then we meditate on um, you know, the Dukkha of cyclical existence and all the different ways that um, the unsatisfactory nature manifests in our lives. Even that, if it's a slower system, it takes a lot of effort, then the impulse to want to go to grandma's can still override all of that. We meditate on the kindness of others. We start to learn to see that we are a part of a network, that it's not just us. 
We're not just some bubble getting on the plane. And then, you know, meditating on dependent arising and so forth. All of this gives us a much, much, much bigger view than looking out the window, the street looks the same. Looking in the mirror, our face looks the same. So I was just appreciating how the meditations we do, the longer meditations that we do every day, expand our minds and our hearts. They're all method side of the path, but we're developing wisdom as we go with every one of these. It is slower, that analysis. It, is a, it does take effort. And one of the things that he also talks about human behavior that correlates completely with what we're um, taught with in, in our Dharma teachings is we, things get um, more, uh, well, that familiarity is the key <laughs> to imprint these things deeper in our mind so that that goal-directed system is stronger than the immediate associative system. Before we begin to override our immediate impulse to react to what we see straight in front of us. Repetition, familiarity, going through it again and again and again from the neuroscientific point of view, but also from our practice point of view. The other thing he said is that if, for human beings, if you make a commitment, you will follow through, more likely to follow through. Meaning, verbalize that you will make a commitment. He said, if, even if you have a realization, for example, that it is dangerous for me to go out without a mask on, therefore, you, you may even choose. Therefore, whenever I go out, I'll, I will go with a mask. But you may not, because that thought will recede. But if you turn to a member of your family or another human being and you say, I am going to always wear a mask when I go out, that conviction will stay with you. So it's like when we make a practice commitment to our teacher. You know, we may have the intention, and I've seen this in my own practice. There are some practices that I have a personal intention to do, and then there's, there are some practices I have that I have made that commitment that I will do daily. The, the practices I have made the commitment to the teacher get done. The practices I have made the commitment to myself to do mostly get done. <laughs> but if there's a little bit of slack and I am really sleepy, Maybe that'll wait till tomorrow. So we can keep ourselves safe as Buddhist practitioners moving in the world of pandemic. It's easy to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, we're all going to get vaccinated. Everybody's going to be fine. But there's a long way between now and then. I just saw somewhere that now people over 75 are going to get vaccinated. Well, it's not us in this room yet. So, you know, that will take, take some time. Some people will soon. But also, I think for me, just hearing this in terms of how to stay healthy, but also then how to stay healthy in the bigger, longer term. It validates the effort that we put into changing our mind, for me. Um, it validates the understanding that, it, that the system is... Um, weaker than the associative system. This goal-directed system, as he calls it, is weaker and needs to be developed. We know that's true. And the result is that minds actually change. So I was thinking that even just on this principle then, if we really trusted that, then the steps towards becoming Buddha are very clear. You just keep working with that goal-directed system, doing the meditations that we've been taught, it transforms the mind, the mind changes. This, that system of wisdom overrides our ignorance, conventionally and then ultimately, so that um, we can do the path. So I was appreciating NPR. I was appreciating um, Dr. Gaurav Suri. Sorry, not sorry, Suri at San Francisco State. And um, also the validation from neuroscience that, if, in case we need it, that uh, practicing the Dharma is a long way towards transforming our minds and making the world a safer, healthier place.